Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. The problem of homelessness in New York City just gets worse and worse. It doesn't seem to matter who's mayor or what the economy is doing. The number of people flooding the city's homeless shelters just goes up and up. It is now hit an all-time high. Nearly 60,000 of the homeless are crammed into the city's shelters each night. That's close to the entire population of Schenectady, New York. 25,000 of those homeless people are children. Homelessness, especially family homelessness, is also a problem nationwide, and children are hit particularly hard. Well over a million American school children are homeless. We'll talk about these issues with my guest, Dr. Ralph DaCosta Nunez, president of two groups that help the homeless. One is called Homes for the Homeless, and the other is the Institute for Children, Poverty, and Homelessness, an independent research and policy organization here in New York. Uh, Dr. Nunez, welcome, and thanks for coming in. I appreciate it. Okay. You know, um, I remember writing articles about New York City's homeless problem uh, way back in the 1970s and 80s at the Daily News. Uh, why does this problem not only persist, but seem to get worse year after year? Well, the transition really becomes in the 80s, 1980s with the Reagan administration, and we begin to change the safety net. We have major inflation, uh, public assistance is locked in, and you start to see a standard of living decline. Prior to that in New York, you always had homeless families and individuals, but it was a limited number. It was a crisis. Then you started to grow it. The 1980s were a period when we went from 800 homeless families to 5,000, major growth. And then we go into the 1990s and we reform welfare. We notch more people down. What you've seen is a real notching down of lower income population in New York City. The end result, homelessness. Well, you know, now we're talking about going back uh, 30 years mm -hmm. or more, but we had what they described as an economic boom during the Clinton years. Um, you know, um, then we had uh, obviously the Great Recession and the housing foreclosure crisis, but the ups and downs of the economy don't seem to make any difference. Uh, why is that? They don't. The recession was a bump in it, but uh, nothing like that. It's because this is now a part of the poverty curve you now have institutionalized homelessness. Homelessness are simply the poorest of the poor, those that have the hardest time competing or maintaining an independent living. And these are also families you'll find, if you're looking at the family side, that have problems more than just housing. Homelessness is much more than just a housing issue, and that's one of the reasons why we haven't gotten ahead of the curve. Uh, let's talk about that a little mm -hmm. bit, because there are a, a lot of factors that go into homelessness. So obviously, a lack of affordable housing is a big problem. Employment is a big problem. But talk about some of the other issues involved. Well, when you talk about employment, you have to have skills to be employed. If you look at the population that we see in the shelters, it's kind of a mixed bag. There are families, low-income families, working poor families, that have ended up here for some crisis. They didn't pay the bill, they paid a medical bill, didn't pay the rent, they lost their job, they're in and they'll, they can move out. Then you have people who've been on public assistance for a long time, they may have had some jobs, they may have finished school, but they've been out of work for a long time and they've been dependent on public assistance a long time. They're in the system and they're locked in now with this economy. Then you have families that really have some problems. We see domestic violence as one of the number one causes of homelessness. Foster care, young women that age out of foster care, young men that have nowhere to go at 18, become pregnant, have a child, live with some relatives, end up in the shelter system eventually. Then you also have people who haven't completed their education. Where are we going to go? You can't even work in McDonald's. You have people who don't have job skills. So you're really looking at a very different situation and mental health is in there also. They'll know home with the door is going to solve those problems, which is why we have in New York today a return to shelter rate of almost 56 percent. So when you have such a range of contributing factors to homelessness, how do you begin to get a handle on ways to approach this vast problem? First thing you do is face what it is. This isn't simply a housing issue. I mean, when we talk about this, we always talk about housing. We have a population that's distributed across a continuum of problems. If you understand the problem, then you have to address it that way. The real way to do this is to really triage this population. It's almost a crisis model. Those that we can move out very fast that shouldn't be in here, it's a crisis, let's get them out. Let's not keep them in the system. The other group that maybe it'll take us a little longer to get them retrained, up to date again with the job skills because they haven't worked in a while and to finish some school, get into community college, we move them. And the last group is going to be a long-term problem. 
If you just take a family that's a victim of domestic violence or a young mother who's been in and out of foster care, she's lived a nomadic life, you take her with some young children and give her an apartment, she's going to move and she'll be back. These are the issues. We don't, we don't break it up. We always look at it with a one-size-fits-all policies. And that was one of the biggest problems through almost every administration. Housing, 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 housing. And here we are today. It's gotten so out of control that we have to face up. There's something more and something different that must be done. So we have a new administration now, Mayor mm -hmm. de Blasio. Um, he has um, uh, made it his mission to address the less fortunate uh, New Yorkers. Um, how has his approach to homelessness uh, uh, differed from the last administration, Mayor Bloomberg, and is he beginning to move in the direction that you're suggesting? They're starting to move. It's different in two ways. First, they're listening. <laughs> and not only are they listening, they're open to change. They're open to suggestions. And what you're starting to see, they're now creating a new voucher system, which Bloomberg did. But it failed because the voucher system, you can't give people a voucher for two years and expect that they're going to live independently if they're not ready for it. This new administration has linked the first group of vouchers to people with jobs. There is your highest success. If you want to reduce 60,000, that number, then you've got to take the best shot of taking the edge off. People who have jobs, give them vouchers. There's a great probability they're going to be independent. The second group, you have to start to face the educational aspect of it because education is the only thing that's going to get employment. It's going to deal with all these other social ills once you understand what to do about them. And this administration is going to have to face that. That's their next step, and they're not there yet. The problem you have when a new administration comes in the first year is to understand what you have. The second year is to get your arms around it. So we're still in the middle of the game. So the vouchers you're talking about are essentially rent subsidies. Rent subsidies. How does that work? The way it's going to work now with this administration, they will pay a rent subsidy of about $1,500 a month for a one-bedroom apartment. A family can move out, and the family uh, will have to do a piece of it. They'll pay a small percentage of the rent, and then employment is part of it. And then you can get vouchered up for one, two, three, four, maybe five years. They're going to be renewals. It's still very new, so everything's not written on it, but that's where it's going to go. Then there'll be other groups that have long-term problems that eventually they'll look to voucher and move them out. But at some point, where does a voucher end? The public can't pay for a voucher forever is probably the reality here. So you need to retool people to become independent again. You know, homelessness is two, it's two things. Number one, it's a very bad situation to have children stuck in, to have young mothers and families stuck in. The second side is that it's a real opportunity because all of these problems that we've talked about here are behind a closed door. And they lead to other paths, to the juvenile justice system, to the criminal justice system, to lifelong dependency on public assistance. We suddenly see the doors removed, and we see what the crisis is. We have an opportunity to deal with it right here before we finally move people back out. Now, it's unlikely that we would address this in any kind of comprehensive way uh, mm -hmm. starting now. Uh, so uh, very specifically, where would you start? What, uh, w when you're addressing these social ills that contribute to homelessness, what would you, what would you target first? I, first, I'd go to the, again, easiest out, middle, we work on the hardcore, we really have to change what the system is. So the idea is, uh, so vouchers you think are the most important thing, the, these are the folks who uh, would be most likely to be able to make it on their own outside the shelter system if they had a little financial help. That's right. That's right. They have skills, they've worked, they've got education, they can get up and on their feet independent. Wherever they got in here, we get them out. For a family that finds it can't pay the rent, it's out of money, it's being evicted or it has been evicted, and suddenly they're facing the shelter system, mm -hmm. um, what happens with them? They go to an um, intake location, and then what happens after that? They get screened, they're checked for eligibility, they're checked for needs to be sure they have nowhere else to go, and then they'll be sent to a shelter, and it's the luck of the draw wherever the vacancy is that evening. The other thing I should mention though, that this administration is doing that's different is their prevention program. When you talk about a family that finds themselves out of money in crisis, they're going to have to go to the facility. This administration is now open. A major place is opening it in Brooklyn for prevention. You can go there and you'll be able to be serviced without being just accepted into the system. That's a big change. What's an example of prevention services? Somebody comes, I can't pay the rent, I'm going to be evicted tomorrow you can get an emergency allocation of funding. Or somebody comes and says, somebody's very sick in our family, you know, we don't know what to do, can't work anymore, we can help you with that situation. It's a prevention step by step so that you don't get into the system, because once you're in the system, it's a hard, it's a hard drawer. 
There are three things really that happen here. One is the voucher system. It's an exit policy. Affordable housing, the administration is committed to developing hundreds of units of thousands of units of affordable housing. It'll never be enough. It'll help. You'll move some people out. And again, you should prioritize who goes. And the third is prevention. And prevention will prevent some people from ever coming into the system. It'll take other people and delay, but eventually they'll probably end up here. The population that's actually in the shelters is only... Um one portion of the homeless homeless problem in New York City. You've got all these families who don't have a place to stay, but they've doubled up either with mm -hmm. friends or with relatives or they found some other place to stay for a short period of time. Can you talk about that a little bit and give us a sense of how large that homeless population really is? That's a large population. That's why we never see these numbers go down. The Board of Ed actually counts doubled up families with students as homeless. The homeless department doesn't because they're not in there their system yet. There are 80,000 homeless students in the New York City school system. 60,000 are doubled up. That's, you know, 60% more than the kids in the shelter system. And they're just waiting to come. That is a system that works. You go and you stay with some family for a while, you stay with another family for a while, and the probability of eventually ending up in a shelter is very high because the apartments are overcrowded. An argument starts, a landlord finds out there's a lot of people living here, and you have to move out. So we need to focus also on the doubled up population. What are we going to do? And the best identifier happened to be the students. We start right with the next generation here in school. And schools have an important role to play in the prevention of future homelessness. All of these things come together. The problem we have with homelessness is when we see the issues I talk about mental health, well, that belongs to this department. Oh, education, that belongs to this department. Oh, you have domestic violence, well, that's over here in victim services. To have a comprehensive policy is extremely difficult. It's a mobile population. It's a nomadic population. It moves. And that's one of the policy problems that have been, you know, preventing reducing this more, in a more permanent status. So this is a chaotic kind of existence when you're homeless. Now, you've mentioned the students, the youngsters. Mm -hmm. What's it like for them? I can tell you, a typical homeless child moves once or twice a year. Each one of those moves is a six-month educational setback. They miss five or six weeks of school. That's more than the average student. They get left back at higher rates because they move around. They repeat grades and the highest dropout rate when you're homeless, when eventually you hit the 10th grade, we see them dropping out. So we're dealing with a double-edged sword. That's why I say when we talk and we say it's just about housing, well, it's a lot more than that. And people will say, well, without that housing stability, this would be fine. It's not the case. There's a great instability in the population that we need to address. Not all of them, but with a very important segment of them. There, you know, there seems to be a paradox. We talk about um, um, market rents on the, mm -hmm. on the one hand, um, and then on the other hand, we talk about affordable housing, and, and these are two very yes. different things, especially, especially in New York City. So doesn't that essentially mean that the market is not working in the sense that the market is not providing one of the fundamental aspects of survival for ordinary families? Well, that's true. And the issue of affordable is a question. Affordable for who? Most affordable housing demands $50,000 income, $40,000 income. You don't see that in this particular population. And the investment in low-income housing has stopped. The biggest investor in low-income housing in America has always been the federal government, HUD. HUD went out of business. <laughs> it right. may be there, but it's truly right. out of the housing business. And so no one will say it, but shelters have become the surrogate for low-income housing. That is a fact in the city of New York. But it's, it's penny-wise and pound-foolish, it seems to me. I mean, you hear homeless families saying all the time that the amount of money the city has to spend to keep them in shelters for whatever length of time uh, is more than what they would have to pay for rent for an apartment. Is, is that really the case? That argument is always made. And again, it sounds, it sounds like it's so easy. Let's just take this money and get an apartment. Well, those funding streams are very specific. That's an emergency funding stream. And people always say, well, you know, what, you know what would happen if we didn't pay to have a family in shelter at $30,000 a year? That family would break up. And if you had a mother with family and two children, the mother would be in a single shelter, $20,000 a year, and the two kids would end up in forced security at $40,000 each. Now it's $100,000. The issue isn't about the money. The issue is about the shelter and what a shelter is. We still, after 30 years, see shelters as temporary emergency facilities. Well, that has a whole nature of chaos tied to it. It's an emergency. I'm not here long. Well, you are going to be here long. So how can we get ahead of the curve? Change the nature of what a shelter is. 
stop opening shelters in communities that people hate them. Nobody says, oh, <laughs> open a shelter here. Yes, no one welcomes it. Why aren't we building instead, opening community residential resource centers that have a residential component for the homeless family, but have a community piece in that an example would be a culinary institute. We're going to teach culinary arts, you know, employable in the food services. There's lots of work with that. And it's really this community center, and the community can participate in that. And you have the daycare here for not only the homeless families, but the community. The after-school programs for the homeless families and the community. The employment program for the homeless families and the community. Now you have a community resource. Now you have something that people welcome. Now you take the edge off this crisis. And we, that, that's the problem. We have to stop looking at this as a crisis because it's not a crisis anymore. It's a fact of life. <laughs> yeah, if it goes on for 10, 20, 30, 30 years, years, then you still call it a crisis. It's not. You know. I agree. So you, you are the head of two organizations right. that uh, address the homeless issue. So mm -hmm. tell us what they do. Well, the Institute does research on this and tries to look at policies and looks at 30 years and numbers here in New York and across the country and see the trends and predict what might be next and where we might better use our resources and what's going on. This is the Institute for Children, Poverty, Poverty and, and Homelessness. Homeless. And yeah. we deal primarily with families and children. It's our, our biggest interest there. That's, that's sort of an academic uh, public policy type. Homeless for Homeless actually houses 550 families in the city of New York for the last 29 years and about 1,000 children a night. And we see what goes on. I mean, you do that for 29 years, you get a pretty good sense. We've seen several generations now. We see the verge of a whole new generation of homeless. Our parents today are very young. You know, 10 years ago, a mother was in her, almost 30 years old. Now she's down to 22, 23 again with two very young children. Oh, a little more than half of all the kids in the shelter system today are under six. I mean, they're, they're really young, young kids. And so are the mothers. But that's your greatest opportunity. Every time that generation becomes very young, you have the greatest opportunity to make a radical right turn on poverty because that's what homelessness is about. Not housing, but poverty, a very, very severe poverty that pushes people. We have tons of people who are poor, tons of people who are living independently, and they're making it. This is a group that has a very hard time doing that. Uh, you mentioned domestic violence as a contributor. Mm -hmm. um, explain... Um what happens then? I mean, you, you, you understand that um, you have this violence in the home, but why does that lead to homelessness? Well, people, victims of domestic violence, uh, young women, um, go back to the abuser over and over again. The studies show they'll go back four, five, six times. And you normally think, you leave, I'm not going to put up with this, but that's not the case. They go back. It's what they, what they know and think is a way of life. The children get to see that violence, and you suddenly see the young kids picking up those particular habits. Finally, there's a crisis bad enough where the woman has nowhere to go with her kids and she goes to the shelter system and gets lost in the 60,000 number. Right. We've been talking about homeless families and, and children, right. um, but there's a, a fair number of uh, single adults yeah. who are homeless as well. Now, years ago, we used to see what we called then bag ladies and bag mm -hmm. men on the streets. You don't see that so much anymore. So what's happening with the single individuals who are homeless? Well, I think you do see them on the street a lot more now. Having been around this issue for so long, you just get the eye for it. I haven't seen it this bad in a long, long, long time. The single population right now in the shelter system is at a pretty all-time high. It's over around 10,000. Hasn't been that high in years and years and years. You have in that population a very different mix. You have a mental health component that were deinstitutionalized, and you know we don't institutionalize anyone anymore. We give them drugs and hope that they take their meds, and they don't if they, they stop going to the community service center. So they're in the population. Then you have in that population also people who have fallen out of the system. They lost their jobs or their family fell apart years ago, uh, whether it be male or female, and they end up single adults on the street and end up in a single shelter system. And that's a group, you'll have a group that runs around a 35 age group, and then you have an older group that's 55 and above that are chronic uh, homeless people. They may have been substance abuse and drugs and that cuts across the board. And you also have people that are released from jail who have nowhere to really go and end up in the shelter system. So the single system is kind, is kind of a mixed bag. It, that's why you always see sometimes there's a case of a criminal issue here or just you know, some other sad story of some woman on the other side of the curve. Now, you mentioned um, uh, poverty. Mm. Uh, I've talked a, a great deal about employment. 
So we have a continuing poverty problem, and we don't mm -hmm. create enough jobs in this economy for all the people who need them, or certainly not enough good jobs. So if it turns out that this economy cannot provide the employment that's necessary to keep people out of poverty, do we need to turn to more or at least consider more radical solutions, uh, something like a guaranteed annual income or something like the government as employer of last resort? I think government as employer of last resort, one of the most successful programs we ever had that Nixon created was the CETA program, Comprehensive Employment Training Program. And the CETA program put so many people to work and took them off public assistance and gave them city jobs. They worked on the highways, they worked in city offices, they worked in daycare centers. It was a major success. We cut it out under Reagan. That's what we begin to see, this notching down. You have today in America a middle class that's been notched down. They're not going to have homes as big as they used to, not going to have beautiful cars and tons of kids. You do that, you push the middle class down, you notch down the working poor, lower income, you notch them down, you notch down the poorest of the poor, and then you get your homelessness in the bottom. One of the things I've never quite understood is we give enormous tax breaks to developers of the highest end housing in this country, so in this city. Uh, some of it is, uh, you know, multi, multi, multi million dollar apartments and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Uh, at the same time, we have record numbers of homeless people and we can't find proper shelter for them. Does this make any sense at all? Well, it doesn't make sense, but you know, New York doesn't make much sense anymore. <laughs> Manhattan has become the Hamptons on the Hudson. It's different. If you're poor, you're certainly not living in Manhattan. If you're middle class, you're not. If you're a working kid just out of college, it's difficult. Well, actually, Brooklyn is becoming... Brooklyn is this, it's next. Many, many neighborhoods in Brooklyn have become uh, really unaffordable. They are unaffordable. And if you go to neighborhoods like Bed-Stuy, and you see in Bed-Stuy, what's happened is you're having a competition in poor neighborhoods. As gentrification takes place, people who've lived there and grown up for generations in their neighborhoods are pushed out. So where do they go? They move to the next poor neighborhood. They go to Brownsville next door. Now you have competition between the poor and the poorest, and somebody's going to lose. And the loser is the person who ends up in the shelter system. So we mentioned um, that family homelessness is actually a, a problem, not just in New York City, but uh, it's a national problem national. Um, mm -hmm. as, as well. Are the factors basically the same or uh, similar everywhere you go? They're basically the same. Uh, if you went to Denver, everybody would be white. If you're in New York, right. it's predominantly uh, Hispanic and African American. It's just where you go. It's the same thing. It's, it's, a, it's a pushing down of a population that can't compete at the very bottom. Well, it would seem to me that um, cities, in, in New York you have a, um, uh, a right to shelter. I mean, the city mm -hmm. is obliged That's legally right. to provide shelter for uh, homeless people. Uh, that's not the case uh, across the country. But it would seem to me that municipalities or even states uh, don't have the financial resources to take care of this problem. So at some point, there, there has to be a big federal component. Um, are, is anyone seriously addressing that? Well, the federal government has bought into something called Housing First, which is if you're homeless, we're going to get you a house first and all these other problems, we'll deal with it. And that is part of the problem. Bloomberg bought into that. We had eight solid years of Housing First in New York City. Now we have 56% of those people came back because Housing First wasn't the answer. It's Housing Second after we take care of making you set to be independent. So if you're paying attention to housing, you're not giving the requisite attention to all these other issues that contribute to homelessness. Not for everybody, though. I point out again that it's, it's a population that's made up of three basic groups, and I'm talking about the hardest right. to deal with. Got you. Uh, Dr. Nunez, it's uh, been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming in. Appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. Among the great joys of living on the Atlantic coast, are the fabulous beaches and that vast, majestic, awe-inspiring ocean, one of the true wonders of the planet. I grew up going to the Jersey Shore, the beaches of Brooklyn and Queens, and the pristine coastline of Montauk and the Hamptons. As an adult, I have visited beaches from Florida to Maine. So I take it as a personal affront that the Obama administration is planning to open up a huge expanse of the Atlantic waters to oil and gas drilling. 
What could they possibly be thinking with this decision, which borders on the sacrilegious? Have they already forgotten the catastrophic BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico? And does this latest round of drill, baby, drill mean that the president and his advisors have retreated into denial about climate change? Do they not know that the year 2014, just ended, was the hottest ever recorded? I thought we were supposed to be developing alternatives to the fuels that have so fouled our environment and are threatening life forms all over the globe. Politics taints everything it touches, and now it's decided to spread its taint, literally, along the magnificent natural wonder of the eastern seaboard. That's all for now. See you next time.